will get started. So we'll start with a simple system model and an attack model. So my system is xt plus 1 equals axt plus I want to uh, this is my actuation noise this is my observation noise and this is my attack vector. So we have the usual thing WT is caution with mean 0 and covariance sigma W. VT is caution with mean 0 covariance sigma V then AT is caution So we have the typical linear systems model, uh, the state space model, and we have the actuation noise, the observation noise, and now we are adding an attack vector to the observation. What that means is that the adversary is changing some of the readings that is going to get fed into the controller. So the attacker is spoofing the signal, spoofing the observation signal. So in the case of this room, the attacker is trying to change the temperature reading. The temperature reading will be changed by the attacker's action. <coughs> For the purpose of today's discussion, we will assume that the attack vector is also a random vector. Uh, with mean 0 and covariance sigma i. It really doesn't matter if we know this value or not, because uh, the way we are going to set up the problem, we don't care about this part, we only care about the knowledge of sigma v and the knowledge of sigma w, and of course, ABC matrices. We can use the filtering algorithm, let's say the Kalman filter that we talked about, to get x hat t equals to where L is the, this is L, L is called the observation gain and we will assume that rho of A plus LC is less than 1. So rho is the spectral radius of the matrix A plus LC and I want the spectral radius of a plus LC to be strictly less than 1. Any question so far? Is the attack model clear? We are just adding noise to the observation vector. So I have car on the road and the attacker is changing the reading of the rotation sensor in the wheel or I have a building and the attacker is changing the temperature readings 
within the building. In order to compute the, like we cannot really observe the state uh, completely because we can only make this observation which is also noisy. As a result of which we need to use a filtering algorithm. So we talked about Kalman filter a few days back. So let's say we are using some Kalman filter algorithm in order to filter and get the estimate of x hat t plus 1 based on all the observations I've made so far. Uh, so this is what the evolution of the filtered value, the estimate of the state is going to look like. This is the estimate that is getting fed into the controller, by the way. So controller u of t will be k times x hat of t. So in your assignment, I think all of you are assuming that I mean, the assignment is created by me, but uh, we are assuming in those assignments that uh, the controller is making the complete observation. So the state is getting fed into the controller, but in this case, the controller only knows x hat of t and using that to come up with the control action using some linear transformation. Okay. Now the goal for us is to figure out, so the attack vector, so sometimes the attacker is not present and sometimes the attacker is present. Uh, so sometimes this AT is equal to zero because there is no attacker. And then at other point of time, an attacker comes in and, and you have a non-zero AT getting added to the system. Now the goal for us is to figure out whether there is an attacker in the system or not. The goal is to figure out if this AT is equal to zero or this AT is uh, non-zero. <clears throat> so let's try to come up with an algorithm for uh, testing whether an attacker is present or not. So I'm going to come up with a variable error which is x hat t minus x t. So let's look at ET plus 1. X hat T is this and X T is this. So I can write it as A plus LC ET minus BUT gets cancelled L by T minus Did I make any mistake? So I have added a plus LC, minus LC XT here, and then I added the plus LC XT here. So that's the only difference I have, only change I have made. So you can think of this as A plus LC XT minus LC XT plus BUT plus WT. So if you think of it as that, then you get this expression. Uh, let's look at this particular expression. So this is yt minus cxt. So if I take minus l out, this is yt minus cxt. What is yt minus cxt? It's vt plus at. So this way, I get et plus 1. this is what I get. OK, 
Can I know what the error is? Do I know what the error is? I, I know what the expression for the error is, but can I actually observe the error? Can I observe E of t? No, I cannot. Because I don't observe x of t. I cannot see this, I can only estimate it. So I only know x hat of t. I don't know what x of t is. Okay. So let's try to define something called a residual. So I've defined error. Let's try to define residual. This is estimation error. So residual is RT denoted by C x hat t minus y t. Can I observe residual? Can I compute it? I can compute it. I know x hat t exactly, I know y t exactly, so I can actually compute this residual. So error is something I don't know, but residual is something that I can calculate exactly. So this is c of x hat t minus c of x t minus v t minus a t. So this is c of e t minus v t minus a t. Now let's assume that a t equals to 0. So I'm going to assume, I'm going to figure out what happens when the attack, there is no attacker in the system. So then my e t plus 1 equals to a plus l c e t minus l v t minus W t and my R t equals to C E t minus V t. What should we do to detect the presence of an attacker, AT? So this is what is going to happen when there is an attack. And residual is all that I can observe. RT is the only thing I can observe. So when the attacker is present, I am observing this quantity. When the attacker is not present, I am observing this quantity. So based on this, what do you think we should do to deduce whether there is an attacker in the system or not? Any thoughts? So this is the this is the residual with attacker, this is the residual without attacker. And residual is something that I can observe. <coughs> So you can see that in this case, you have like a random number. I cannot observe this part, I cannot observe this part, but I know that this is some random value. And then I get some other random value gets added, random vector gets added to this particular random vector. So in the non-attack case, I'm seeing this random vector. In the attack case, I see an addition of another random vector, okay? So if I'm looking at 
If I'm looking at this time series, residual at time one, residual at time two, residual at time three, uh, what actually happens in the presence of an attacker? The distribution actually changes. Okay, the distribution of the residual changes in the presence of an attacker. So when AT is not equal to zero, the PDF of RT changes. So let's try to detect. However, here is the issue. I don't know what sigma A is. I don't know what the intensity of the attacker is. I don't know if the attacker is attacking only one of the nodes, one of the readings, or the attacker is going to attack all the readings. So I really don't know anything about the attacker. All I know is attacker is going to add uh, its own noise in the system. And I don't know what sigma A is. So I don't know what the, how the, so I know what the PDF is going to look like before the attack. I don't know what the PDF is going to look like after the attack. So that's the question. That's the problem that I'm facing. But I do know that once the attack starts, the PDF of the residual is going to change. The probability density function of residual is going to change. Okay. So what I'm going to do, the, the tests that I'm going to discuss today are going to be tests which is going to look for a change in the variance of RT. So we'll try to figure out the variance. Uh, the, so, so, what we are, so this is known as a chi-square test. And the detection mechanism is we look at the variance of RT at every point of time. And if we detect a change in the variance of RT, then we know that some attack is actually ongoing on the system. However, uh, just know that these are some of the attack detection algorithms that are studied in the literature. Uh, depending on the situation, depending on if you know, if you have more information about the attack vector, you can come up with your own detection algorithm. Okay, so I'm going to find out what, uh, so once I know what, what the error covariance, uh, so, sorry, what the error is going to look like, I can find out the covariance of the error So as t goes to infinity, the error covariance sigma e is going to satisfy a plus lc sigma e a plus lc transpose Okay, so I can compute sigma e by evaluating this particular expression repeatedly, and I'll get what sigma e looks like at any point of time. And then my sigma r is going to look like c sigma e c transpose plus sigma v.
So this is all under the no attack case. That's what my sigma e, the error covariance, is going to look like. Uh, so this, as t, raised to, t goes to infinity, is going to be equal to sigma e, which is given by this expression. Uh, sigma e is a fixed point of this expression, but you can compute sigma e by repeatedly evaluating this expression at a specific value of sigma e. Like you can start from any initial condition here, keep evaluating it, eventually this whole expression is going to converge because we had assumed that the rho spectral radius of a plus lc is less than 1. So as a result of which this iteration is going to converge. Um, and so we will be able to figure out what sigma e is, and from there I can figure out what my sigma r is, right? Because all of this is known. C is known, sigma e is known, sigma v is known. So I can figure out what sigma r is going to look like. And then I'm going to define residual rt as sigma r minus 1 over 2 rt. So sigma r is just a matrix. Uh, any, peop, do you know what the square root of a matrix looks like? What is square root of a symmetric matrix? Do you guys know? No? I don't think, I, I have not taught you, but I'm not sure if you've studied it before or not. But anyway, sigma r, so let's say uh, I have to use a matrix, A, B, C, L, K, they are all taken. D, no, I don't want to use D. Can you give me a notation? D, E, F, F. Have we used F? No, we are not using F right now. So F is a positive semi-definite matrix. Then F raised to half is a matrix such that f raised to half, f raised to half equals to f. And the way to compute this matrix is very easy. You have u comma v eigenvalue of f. So on MATLAB you get uh, u is the set of eigen, u is the set of eigenvalues and v is the set of eigenvectors. So then this is eigenvalue, this is, and this is eigenvector. And you can find out f raised to half as v square root of u v transpose where by square root of a diagonal matrix, you take the square root of diagonal entries. So this square root operation is only defined for positive semi-definite matrices because you know that every entry of this diagonal matrix U is going to be uh, is going to be non-negative. So square root of the diagonal matrix is very easy to compute because if everything is non-negative, non you can take the square root of each of the diagonal entry and you get the square root of the diagonal matrix and then you just multiply it by V and V transpose on the other side. That gives you the positive, uh, the square root of the matrix and then I'm taking the inverse of the square root of sigma R. So sigma R is a positive definite matrix or positive semi-definite matrix, I'm taking the inverse of, well, it has to be positive definite because I'm taking the inverse of sigma r raised to half. So, so I get r, of, uh, r bar of t. So this is my normalized residual. Any questions so far? No? I'm going to erase this part.
Okay, so when you when you do this, this becomes so r bar t becomes a Gaussian random vector with mean zero and covariance i. Okay, so you remove all the correlations across the RT terms, you, you remove all the correlation by pre-multiplying it by sigma r raised to minus half, and then your r bar t becomes a zero mean and uh, unit covariance random vector. So chi square detected. My hypothesis H naught is R bar T is zero identity. H A is R bar T zero. And how do I write it? Not identity. Okay, so what did we do? We figured out a quantity that we can compute based on all the information we have received so far. So remember, x hat of t contains all the information that you have received so far because that's how you get the estimate. So you compute the residual, right? Now, if the attacker is not present, then I know that the residual, the covariance of the residual is gonna look like this. I'm going to normalize the residual uh, by pre-multiplying it by this matrix in order to get something which is mean zero and covariance is identity matrix. Now, if the attacker is present, then this no longer is the covariance of the residual, which means R bar of T will no longer have identity as the covariance matrix. It might still be mean zero, but it will not have identity as the covariance, and that's what I want to check in this particular detector. And the way to check it is a simple algorithm, not the best one, but it works, is as follows. Okay, let me ask you, how do you, how do you, how do you know, how would you test for this hypothesis? What is your Z of T? What is your Z of T? Well, I'm going to check for the following. R, T, R bar T transpose R bar T. And my rejection region, tau infinity. Typically, tau will be greater than the dimension of RT. Okay, any question so far? So if I'm computing this R bar T transpose R bar T, if my this, this uh, value is less than tau, then it means that H naught is true. If it is greater than tau, it means that HA is true. 
When HA is true, what do we do? We raise an alarm that there is an attack happening. Is something wrong here? The residual has some value which is getting added, which we do not recognize. What is the problem with this particular approach? What problem do you see with this approach of attack detection? Any idea? Any thoughts? What is the problem with this particular detector? The problem with this detector is occasionally this thing might become greater than tau, occasionally. Okay, once in a while it might become greater than tau. As a result of which you will raise an alarm, but at the next time step, it will become smaller than tau. And then you will be like, okay, was this a legitimate alarm or a false alarm? Okay, because RT, remember, R bar T is a random variable. So you are, you are multiplying, you are taking the norm of a random vector. Uh, and the norm of the random vector will be, of course, a random quantity. And it will go down and it will go up. And whenever it's up, it'll automatically raise an alarm, but actually there may not be any, it might just be a random event. It need not have a specific attacker behind it. Okay, so that's the problem with this particular detector. So we need to come up with something which is a bit better. So let's look at the QSUM detector. Here zt plus 1 equals to max of zt plus r bar t transpose r bar t minus a constant. Zero. <clears throat> And the rejection region is again tau infinity. Okay, what's the benefit of QSUM detector? The benefit is, like we talked about in the previous lecture about QSUM. So QSUM score generally hovers around zero if there is no attack happening. And then when the attack happens, the score starts increasing. Okay, so this will be when the, this will be when the attack starts. And depending on the threshold, let's say this is your threshold tau, you will actually detect the attack here. There are two parameters here that you can change. One is this constant and one is this tau. So depending on your preference, you can pick whatever constant and tau you want in order to optimize the false alarm rate and um, and the detection delay. <clears throat> yes? So in the previous case, why don't we consider to choose a better tau instead of like change the testing function? Yeah, so you can, ch you can change tau. The, uh, see, the issue is that depending on the application, you might pick one detection over the other. So for instance, in this case, uh, uh, I, 
frankly, I don't really think this one is more difficult than that. I think there is a bunch of function that you are computing, but it's not very complicated. This detector was just, like the reason why I co covered this detector is just to show you that you can come up with your own detection algorithm. It may just be a bad or good detection algorithm depending on how you pick the algorithm. So I don't think that is a very good detector. But it's still a detector. It's still a valid hypothesis test. It just doesn't have very good performance. And you can pick tau up and down. You can try to optimize it. But it would be much better to optimize this particular system than to optimize that. You will definitely get much better performance here in comparison to that. OK? <clears throat> Any other question? OK. OK, so this was one way to figure out, one way to detect whether there is, a, uh, there is an attack happening or not. And for this, you need to compute the residual R of t. And then you need to figure out how do you, like you need to come up with a QSUM score based method for detecting the attack. There's another method, which is PCA based method. And I want to talk about that method now. Can I erase this side of the board? OK. So let's try to see why this PCA-based detection scheme should work. So let's come back to the building example. I have DL264 and DL260. And let's say I'm noting down the temperature of the room at 3 PM. What is the temperature here and temperature of DL260? So let me say it's 72 and 72. Then at 3.05 PM, it's 73 and this is also 73. At 3.10 PM, this is 71 and this is 71. OK? So what do we notice here? That DL264 and DL260 has the same temperature at all points of time. And what is the average temperature? 72, 72, right? That's the average temperature. OK, now the attacker wants to attack the temperature sensor of DL264 and it wants to change the reading to 80. How do we detect that there is an attack happening? So this is what we observe all the time. And there is this one specific time when I'm observing that one of the temperature sensor is giving a reading which is not the expected reading. The expected reading here is 71, because DL260 has 71 degrees Fahrenheit. But actually, I'm seeing 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So either this sensor is attacked, or this sensor is attacked. One of these sensors is attacked. But at least we are able to detect the attack. So let's try to formalize what this algorithm is trying to do. So I'm observing y1. So this is my y1 transpose. This is my y2 transpose. This is my y3 transpose. So y1 transpose is 70, 72. 72, this is 73, 73, and this is, let's go back to the original. Seventy one and Y bar is seventy two, seventy two.
Okay, so here is the matrix I'm going to create, capital Y. This is Y1 transpose, Y2 transpose, Y capital T transpose. And I'm going to subtract Y bar from each of these. Y bar, Y bar, Y bar. Y bar is the average value. And then I'm going to get a matrix. I need to give this matrix a name. What should I call it? Y tilde. Okay, now what's the covariance of all of these vectors is? So covariance of y, oh this y is, this y is different. I need to give it a different name then. What name should I give this matrix? Are we using, we have we used S so far? We have not used S. So let me give this, no, S is a covariance, estimated covariance. I need a matrix. M. M, good, M. And this would be my M tilde. So I want the covariance of Y, which is m tilde transpose m tilde over n minus 1 or uh, yeah let me put it n here so n minus 1 perfect so this is my covariance and this is gain going to give me a positive definite matrix this is a Hopefully, this is a positive definite matrix. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's positive definite or not. But it's a symmetric matrix. It's a positive semi-definite matrix. So this is my estimate. This actually is an estimate. So let me make it an estimate. So what have we done so far? We've collected n samples of the observations. I've subtracted the mean from the observation. Uh, I get a matrix M tilde. I'm doing M tilde transpose M tilde, which is going to be a very big matrix. So I'm going to divide it by n minus one because there are n such readings and then uh, that gives me the covariance of y okay so i get covariance of y that gives me an estimate of covariance of y now i'm going to do the singular value i'm going to do the uh, decomposition of covariance of y the eigenvalue eigenvector decomposition so i get let's say uh, lambda 1 v1 lambda 2 B2, lambda M, B, M are eigenvalues and eigenvector of this matrix covariance of Y. And I'm going to further assume that lambda 1 is greater than equal to lambda 2 is greater than equal to lambda 3.
Okay, so I've computed the eigenvectors of these ma this matrix, covariance of y, v1, v2, v3, all the way up to vm. I have lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and I've arranged this index in a manner that lambda 1 is strictly greater than or equal to lambda 2, which is strictly greater than or equal to lambda 3, and so on. So it's in the decreasing order of uh, eigenvalue. So v1, v2, v3, these are known as principal eigenvectors. These are all of the same dimension. Same as dimension of yt. So basically whatever is the dimension of y, rm is the dimension of y. So you, these vectors are also in uh, m dimensional vectors. And what is going to happen is going back to this Dries example, So the, these, these were my data points from the Dries lab, this room and the other room. So this is my uh, temperature of DL4264 minus average temperature of DL264. This side is temperature of DL. 260 minus average temperature of DL260, right? And what we had noticed is these two temperature are along this particular line, right? They are at y equals to x line because both the temperatures were equal at all point of time. So this would be my V1, this direction, this vector would be my V1 and the orthogonal to this will be V2. Yes? Is it supposed to be M tilde, M tilde transpose? Because this is a group of 2 by 2 matrix. Have N cross 2. So this is a R N cross M matrix. And this is my Rm cross M matrix, right? So there are N rows here, N rows here, and each of this is M dimensional. So each row has M, M entries. So yeah, this is correct. So the cool thing here is that this V1, V2, so all of this is very mathematically intensive computation. So you need to, so let's think about it. Uh, let's consider the university wide setting. Okay, so university has how many rooms? How many thermostats does university have? Any idea? Let's take a guess, maybe like 20,000 thermostats because we, university owns Vexna Medical Center, university owns all the buildings. University also has an airport. Have you seen the airport, University Airport? No? Uh, it's on like north of Bethel Road. There is an airport that's actually owned by OSU. So as an OSU affiliate, if you have your own aircraft or whatever, your own uh, private plane, you can actually fly it from there. <laughs> yeah, we are all not there yet, but hopefully we will be there at some point of time, okay? So... <laughs> So you can fly a private jet from OSU airport. So OSU also has an airport, right? And there are multiple sensors at the OSU airport and there are like lots of buildings all over the place. So OSU has probably 20,000 temperature sensors. So this M, so, so this matrix, and let's say in one day we collect, let's say we collect the temperature reading every one minute. So we have how many minutes are there in a day? 16 to 24 whatever that number is, 1440, I think some 1500 minutes in a day. So you have like 1500, in one day, you have like 1500 rows and you have 10,000 columns, okay, in this particular matrix. Now, you may not want to just use one day data to compute this covariance. You probably want to use an entire one year's data to compute the covariance. 
So you'll have probably 1 million rows and you have 10,000 columns. You do this computation, you get a 10,000 cross 10,000 matrix. That's very complicated. Then you compute this eigenvalue and eigenvectors of covariance of y. Each of these are 10,000 dimensional vectors. But lambda m, these are all scalar values, right? So you have 10,000 values and you have 10,000 10, vectors, which are each of which is 10,000 dimensional. Okay. So you do it once when the system was not attacked at all for the entire year. So we know that last one year, OEC did not suffer any cyber attack. So we'll just take the last one year's information, compute this V1 to Vm. Now, what do you notice from this example? So all the points, all the data of Y minus Y bar was along this particular axis. What happened along the other axis? It's equal to zero, okay? So in this case, we notice that Y T minus Y bar transpose V2 was equal to zero. In the case of, uh, in the example that we were using. And when was there an attack? When we found that Yt minus Y bar transpose V2 is not equal to zero, then we said that there was an attack on the system, right? <clears throat> so you can do the same thing here in this particular situation. You can, uh, what generally people do uh, is they define like a cutoff uh, for this index. So let's say lambda 1 is 500, lambda 2 is 300, lambda 3 is 10, lambda 4 would be 1, lambda 5 is 0 0.01. So they'll say, okay, lambda 5 onwards, I think the eigenvectors are all close to 0. So what I'm going to do is, I will look at yt minus y bar transpose v6, and then the same thing, v7. I'll take the absolute value of these numbers. I will square them and I will add them. Okay, and if this big number is greater than tau, there is an attack. If it is less than tau, there is no attack. Do you think computing this is an easy operation? So this is a 10,000 dimensional vector. You subtract the mean, you transpose it and multiply it by V6. The same thing you do for V7 and so on and so forth. So do you think this is an easy operation? I think it's very easy operation. Do you think squaring it is an easy operation? Very easy operation. Adding it all up is an easy operation. Yes, it is an easy operation. So actually this is a method which is computationally very, so there is a there is a lot of time, lot of effort you have to put in early on to compute this V1 to Vm, but once you compute it, implementing the detection part, at the time of detection, you don't have to spend a lot of computational power to detect whether an attack is happening or not, okay? So that's the benefit of this particular approach. And what you are essentially testing here, if you think about it, is you're actually looking at the support of this uh, y minus y bar, yt minus y bar. So you're looking at the support. And if you think that the support has changed for this particular matrix, if the support changes, you know what the support of the distribution is? I discussed it in the previous class. So it's the set at which, the smallest set which has probability one. So if the support has changed, if the points, the usual points of yt minus y bar, if that whole 
area where the point is has changed in the graph, then this particular detection scheme tells you that that particular uh, change has happened and then you can raise an alarm and check whether it's an attack or something else. So this is, uh, this is, this is known as principal component analysis based attack detection, PCA based attack detection. So that's what you are checking. So in the first algorithm, uh, chi-square test, we were checking if the covariance of the residual has changed or not. In the second attack situation, what we are checking is if the support of the distribution itself has changed or not. So we're not looking at residual here at all. We are just looking directly working with the observation. Whereas in the case of residual, we were working with the estimate of the state and the observation that we were seeing. Now, when, when the state, when your C, when your XT is equal to YT, then in that case, you don't really have to estimate the state. And then you can use something like this to detect an attack. Um, and you can still detect if there is an attack happening or not. So anyways, that's, that's all I wanted to cover. We are already out of time. But are there any questions before we, before we depart? No? OK. So Yes, that's right, that's right. So it won't be in the null space of V1 and V2 and V3, but for the rest of the thing, it will be in the null space. And we are just checking that it should be in the null space, then there is no problem. If it is not in the null space, then there is a problem. That's what we are trying to detect. Perfect. Uh, I'll see you guys on Monday. Have a great uh, autumn break. <laughs>